Hello, everyone. My name is Peter Maravellis. On behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers and the City Lights Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to this special edition of City Lights Live, the online component of the City Lights events calendar. As always, we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral homelands of the Ohlone's peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. In today's special program, we are delighted and honored to be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the seminal and visionary novel, Mumbo Jumbo by Ishmael Reed, an essential work in the canon of world literature and the Black American imagination. Mumbo Jumbo stands out as one of the crucial works of 20th century fiction, mixing satire with biting social commentary. Mumbo Jumbo has over the years drawn accolades from the likes of everyone from James Baldwin to Harold Bloom. The novel continues to engage us to this day and Scribner Books has produced an anniversary edition of the novel together with a new introduction by the author welcoming a new generation of readers. We are honored to have with us today Ishmael Reed in conversation with Justin Demange. Ishmael Reed is the author of over 25 books, including the recently published play Life Among the Aryans. His novels include Flight to Canada, Yellowback Radio Broke Down, The Last Days of Louisiana Red, amongst many others. He is also a poet, playwright, publisher, television producer, songwriter, radio and television commentator, and lecturer. Ishmael Reed has long been devoted to exploring an alternative of Black aesthetic. He coined the term neo-hoodooism, developing a writing style hewn from African-based Voodoo aesthetics, characterized by syncretism and synchronicity. He is a regular contributor to, contributor to Counterpunch Journal, has taught at the University of California at Berkeley for over 30 years, and is founder of the Before Columbus Foundation. Mr. Reed has received numerous honors for his work, including a Pulitzer Prize nomination, and is the only person to be nominated for the National Book Award in two categories in the same year. Our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, considered Mr. Reed to be one of the Bay Area's great literary treasures. Joining Ishmael Reed in conversation today is Justin Demange. Mr. Demange is chairman of the Before Columbus Foundation, administrator of the American Book Award, and host of the radio broadcast New Day Jazz. A member of the board of directors of the Oakland Book Festival, Mr. Demange is also a program producer at the African American Center of the San Francisco Public Library. He has written about the works of Ted Jones, Bob Kaufman, and Miles Davis. We've had the great pleasure of having him host numerous events at City Light, so it's a delight to have him back with us again. So we have posted the links in the text of the event description with which you may purchase copies of Mumbo Jumbo, as well as a selection of other titles. So it is a great honor to be able to bring you Ishmael Reed and Justin Demange. Gentlemen, welcome to City Lights Live. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much, Peter. So Ishmael, uh, there's a lot to talk about today and we don't have too much time. Um, so I'll just jump uh, right into it concerning uh, the novel uh, Mumbo Jumbo, which although ostensibly set in the 1920s is also unfolding and emerging from a timeless cosmological uh, dimension, delving uh, into antiquity and the seemingly eternal conflict between monotheistic views of the world and polytheistic views of the world, particularly uh, the often violent collision of cultures emerging from the African continent and those of Europe. So I want to talk about this in terms of how the characters and the action of this book uh, depict individuals who are acting uh, as partisans of the gods, that there is a, a war in heaven, a war in hell, and seemingly this dimension in which we live uh, appears to be a, a, a projection of some of these uh, goals and motives and conflicts. This is something that is continuing in our world today. And uh, mumbo jumbo, as Peter mentioned, has served as a kind of template or key for many people in their uh, struggle to uh, interpret and decipher some of the inner qualifications of uh, 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 the, the conflict that we see today. 
Could you speak to uh, some of this with, that I mentioned, this kind of uh, intersection of different dimensions and those who act uh, in behest of the motives of, uh, of, 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 I'll just say the gods for now. Yeah, well, I think that, uh, I think people like variety <clears throat> and one of the advantages that capitalism uh, has over other systems, economic systems, is that it can offer variety through competition. Mm -hmm. That's both a, uh, a enriches uh, the lives of consumers, but it's also a curse because uh, uh, run, runaway capitalism uh, 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 rates profits even more than the, the survival of the planet. Mm -hmm. So that's where, that's the fatal flaw of capitalism. So that's the, uh, that's what confronts us today. Uh, people prefer variety and we're up against people who, who are uh, absolutists in their uh, view of the world. Mm -hmm. This is conflict in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, I think that mumbo jumbo also represents what Zora Neale Hurston called the X factor. Hmm. Zora Neale Hurston uh, believed that uh, there was a X factor that uh, gave, uh, gave that, that gave rise in Haitian religion to a new lore, like a new brand. Mm -hmm. And uh, although Hollywood has given given a corrupt a version of uh, African religion, which it does, which, which, which the Christians treat these religions the same way. They're all into devil worship. When they came to uh, North America, they dismissed uh, Native American religions as acts of devil worship. Mm -hmm. so that's not unusual, but Christianity has uh, sort of uh, stood in the way of uh, expression and that's that uh, a variety of expressions. And so, uh, that's why we have a difficulty with uh, a Christian, uh, uh, a uh, powerful people who insist upon a Christian nation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're up against uh, in uh, trying to maintain the survival of uh, our cultures. I, I read, for example, in the New York Times that, a, that a, a one style of speaking Spanish is disappearing in disappearing in the southwest because mm. that's what assimilation anglo assimilation does it sort of like rolls over or you know other other uh, forms of uh, of a culture so uh i think that that uh, what happened in our experience and i think that if i had to put a headline on mumble jumbo i would say that uh, that x factor that zolner hurston mm -hmm. in black culture uh sometimes uh produces mass hysteria uh-huh and in my introduction i talk about salem massachusetts the so-called witchcraft hysteria there was an african component uh, to what happened there mm -hmm. although there's a controversy about whether this uh this figure uh, tituba who came from uh, barbados brought introduced african religion into Salem, uh, Bill Cook, the late Bill Cook, professor at uh, Dartmouth, and I went to Salem, and he was able to identify uh, some of the African entities and not gods. I think when when uh, man I admire very much, Thompson wrote uh, the Euro gods of Europe. They're not gods; they're entities. There's only one God, religion, all of the Maori. But he was able to identify the entities that possess these, uh, these women. So from the Salem uh, hysteria on down to woke, mm -hmm. it's like a phantom because when these politicians speak of woke, it's ill-defined and they never mention the origin of woke. Uh, some. Mm -hmm say that uh, some black scholars say it's been around since the 30s. Others uh, give William Melvin Kelly credit in the New York Times in 1962 for creating mm -hmm. the expression. But anyway, 
this is uh, one of the uh, examples of mass hysteria uh, based on something that's associated with uh, with uh, black culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we were talking before about how all these events are related. So example, in the first edition of Mumbo Jumbo, I talked about a coalition of uh, uh, people from different backgrounds. Right. Thing that uh, that uh, the stolen the stolen loot that you find in the Met. I mean, they even steal from Europeans. As a matter of fact, when I toured the the Palace of Versailles in France, the tour guide complained about Met stealing stuff from the cat from the Palace <laughs> of Versailles. So they even steal European stuff, but they insist that all these uh, you know. Uh, objects be returned to the countries of the origin, which is happening now. I mean, the, the, That's French, right. the French said they would they would uh, return everything. And mm. the English said, well, you, you know, you could borrow this stuff. That's the arrogance of the, of the British. Uh, but uh, that, that's all happening. But in, in, the, in, the, in the future, in, excuse me, in, a, in a, a succeeding edition of Mumbo Jumbo, I put uh, pictures of the uh, directors of the Bureau of Columbus Foundation uh, mm -hmm. in the book to represent a kind of coalition uh, that uh, is not a phantom or something uh, uh, invisible, but a living entity that mm -hmm. you're the chairperson. We, we've been around for 44 years or so, but I mean, all of that entered into, it shows my evolution from uh, straddling be between cultural nationalism and the white counterculture. Mm -hmm. Which is was my position in New York, although I lean more toward cult, black culture and nationalism. But I'm, I mentioned in the Woodstock program, which mm -hmm. was one of the holy events of the counterculture, one of the key. Mm -hmm. events. But I mentioned in the program the, the Woodstock program as uh, being one of the uh, three most admired uh, writers of the of the counterculture. But at the same time, I was writing for Liberator, mm -hmm. you know, in Umbra. But all all of that led to to Mumbo Jumbo, uh, my, uh, beginning to explore uh, African religion. Nobody told us that African religion survived the slave trade. Mm -hmm. that, that knowledge has been suppressed. And my uh, meeting uh, Carla Blank, the choreographer, who uh, was in contact with different communities, mm -hmm. the Japanese American avant-garde, the Indian avant-garde in New York, which uh, which influenced me. As a matter of fact, before Columbus begins as a uh, something we call international mind minding, mind minding. Mm -hmm. we, we we would meet in our apartment on Chelsea and Chelsea uh, in New York. Uh, Leah Bernstein, Lynn Chandler, the folk singer, Florence Kennedy, the feminist lawyer, and and but of course uh, it was diff it's difficult to do that in New York because there's so much backbiting. And but we we're more successful. And uh, here in the West Coast, because I, you know the pioneers came out here, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you know people were used to, used to uh, building things. You know we had black whalers. You know, I mean, I just found that out looking at uh, Hal Woodruff's murals, and uh, we had you know people like uh, uh, Ms. Pleasant. They call her Mammy Pleasant, and you know there, there seemed to be a real enterprise in black people established towns out here. So that's, but uh, that's how it started out. So when people list Carla Blank as the founder, one of the founders, well, she in, in a sense she was because that led multiculturalism led me to to uh, you know examining different points of view. Now uh, I think uh, people see uh, uh, some some who don't read the book. I get, you know, I get a lot of criticism of people who don't read my books. They, they I guess they imagine them, you know, like, uh, <laughs> like the woman who uh, inspired that uh, Sidney Powell, the lawyer, Trump's lawyer, right. that you got the message from the wind or something. Remember when she was like, yeah, that's, that's the wind talking to her? So I get people like that who haven't read the book, but it's not an anti-white book because I've made it, I made it clear in the new edition that, uh, uh, our, our way of looking at the world was in line with Julian Apostat, who uh, insisted that the uh, Greek mysteries be restored. The Greek mysteries and the uh, and the uh, uh, African religion are similar. Mm -hmm. Absorb 
the entities of other faiths. Like, you know, I think there's a case to be made that African religion even absorbed Islam because the, the, the Muslims wiped out wiped out in Brazil, places like that. Mm -hmm. Such so troublemakers. You know, we had a they're, they're you know, there were apparently about a thousand slave revolts on the way over here on a ship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, Hollywood gives us one, and then they they messed that up because uh, the Muslims on Amistad were, were literate. You know, they, they could write Arabic. But I mean, that's uh, everything, uh, what's his name, Steven Spielberg touches, messes up when he goes to other people's cultures. Uh, so uh, the Muslims, you know, they would, they would take over these ships during Ramadan. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, you know, so apparently one theory is that uh, Obatala is Allah. Uh -huh. In other words, uh, uh, African religion not only harbored the extinct uh, Haitian uh, Indian deities, but also others. You know, so, yeah. I, so I, think, I think that that was the that was the uh, that was the uh, stuff that we that I borrowed because uh, we were looking for uh, what uh, Larry Neal and. Uh, uh, Larry Hill and others call a non-European aesthetic, and they are revolted against the white aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, you know, how can you revolt against the white aesthetic when you're writing in English? Well, English, or, uh, you know, originates in a dark country. Mm -hmm. You know, English obviously uh, originates in Sanskrit and travel eastward. So you find like a German, a lot of German words for uh, different things are originate in Sanskrit. So, I mean, so, mm -hmm. you know, they call it the Indo-European language. They never talk, they never told us about the Indian part. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I think it's probably the Indo-European language, but they, you hear about the Anglo part, which is derivative of Sanskrit. So uh, I think they were successful. I mean, whatever you might say about the Black Arts Movement, uh, they presented a literature that had no Western antecedent. And I was influenced by that uh, because mumble jumble has no Western antecedent. Mm -hmm. People like Norman Neal tried to copy the book mm -hmm. called Ancient Evenings or something, or he tried to copy Mumble Jumble. And others have, other, other, you know, white uh, writers have tried to, you know, imitate it, but they're not successful. And they would have to fundamentally change their aesthetic in order to uh, do that, to, so I don't have to worry about cultural imperialism. I mean, I don't have, you know, stuff that can't be copied. Uh, but, uh, uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, all, as I was saying, that all of this is connected. Uh, and uh, unlike, uh, you know, people who whose only uh, uh, legacy is eloquence, uh, we, actually, mm -hmm. we actually have built institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, a few moments ago, uh, one of the key elements, one of the most important elements, uh, which is illuminated so expansively throughout the text of mumbo jumbo and that is that the african religions that survived the <clears throat> transatlantic slave trade uh, that emanate now in the americas and have served uh, to uh, revive and resuscitate an image of the past that is in, intact uh, today and uh, really indexed throughout the novel, illuminating the, the, the spheres of our, of our present moment and the struggle that we're in. But one of the techniques of developing this as a, as, as a strategy uh, throughout the novel is its, um, uh, abiding uh, source in music and in ritual, mm -hmm. and specifically uh, the blues impulse uh, and the development of the music uh, that today we call jazz. <clears throat> and part of the uh, characteristics of this are, have to do with um, syncopation and the use of polyrhythms uh, in order to call upon uh, uh, these these uh, entities of of the past and bring them into the present through spiritual possession, 
uh, Zora Neale Hurston in Tell My Horse uh, speaks much of, of this. It, it comes up uh, throughout uh, the book, but I want to focus on this idea of uh, syncopation of rhythms uh, that you use to intersect elements of, of, of the past and restore uh, a, a future of, of possible liberation and possible freedom. One of the touchstones in the book is the Haitian Revolution, uh, which we understand to have emerged from exactly this type of ritual involving music and involving dance. Now, it wasn't until the early 20th century that these things began to be recorded, uh, put onto records, placed on the radio, and that in and of itself is, is, is part of this uh, uh, revolutionary impulse, which leads to Jess Grew, uh, which uh, is, is chronicled in the novel. So thinking about this as a, as a technique, rhythmic syncopation, polyrhythms, and the use of, of, of jazz as a point of view. You know, when we, when we look at people like Charlie Parker or Louis Armstrong, one of the things we see right away is that they pick up on existing structures uh, or, or, or maps, if you will, uh, and then redraw the constellations. New pictures come uh, from what Charlie Parker might see in a composition by Gershwin or Berlin or Porter, but he, but he revives and resuscitates an image of the African past within it that similar to your work uh, may not have otherwise been seen. Could you talk to us a little bit, Ishmael, about uh, this element of, of jazz and blues as not just music, but ritual and culture that helps to excavate an African past so vital in the book? Well, you know, uh, uh, I study Yoruba, and uh, you find that uh, it's a tonal language. Uh, as a matter of fact, when my uh, professor was, we were going through a translation, he'd break out in song. Hmm. Uh, so I think the drum picked up the, uh, the stresses of the uh, language in order to communicate, hmm. which got, which got uh, which got uh, uh, musicians, drummers, the mother drum is probably the source of, of, of those rhythms that we know, mm -hmm. uh, which got the, the musicians in trouble in this hemisphere. Right. But, uh, because, you know, the, the, the colonials finally figured out what was going on, that these people were communicating with each other through these drums. And uh, so Blacks had to learn to improvise. I think that's the key component mm -hmm. of jazz is improvisation. Mm -hmm. They had to keep one step ahead of the law mm -hmm. and use uh, like secret or, uh, you know, signals unknown to the outsider in order to uh, survive. So so when they, uh, in Trinidad, when they banned the drums, the, the Blacks went to steel drums. And, and they, you know, they were able to do that all over the hemisphere because I, as I've said in this uh, film that Darius James made called Who Do in America? Mm -hmm. It's one step ahead of the law. So right. when, jazz, when jazz hit radio, man, it was hysteria. Yep. And, and the, the 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 inventor of the uh, saxophone had a fit. He said, "You know what have you done to my child? You put him in the bowls of ragtime. You know they're all they're all uh, except for the the except for some of the the white composers. I mean, Brahms said somewhere that he would like to play ragtime." And I'm doing this Chopin piece that I can see the influence that uh, Louis Marie, Marie, Marie uh, Gottschalk might have had on him because there's a 16th, uh, there's a 16th in one of his nocturnes that sounds like a, uh, you know, like a uh, tango. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, he said, Chopin said that Louis Marie Gottschalk was who's a, had a black mother, was the feature of the piano. Mm -hmm. He came to Oakland, got in trouble with some women at Mills, and they ran him out of town. Uh oh. I'm trying to get them to write an article about it, Paul's magazine. But uh, yeah, absolutely. I think improvisation is the key. Hmm. And uh, although when you turn on the radio, uh, you know, most of these uh, musicians, those, I don't say most of them, I would say quite a number uh, play the classics of people like Lester Young or uh, Charlie Parker or others, 
and they played at half speed and then they notated. So that's why a lot of it sounds alike. Mm -hmm. Originals like Monk, you know, and Bud Powell, people like that, who mm -hmm. originals, whose stuff has not been, well, I mean, who, who, I mean, all you have to do is listen, even if you're not acquainted with jazz to know there's a difference between the way these guys improvise and play in their, in their harmonics and, and some of the others who, who sort of like copy uh, or duplicate these solos of others. Uh, so, but I mean, yeah, uh, black, uh, what Ortiz Walton calls black or classical music, the, right. the basis uh, has, has always, I mean, I mean, you know, it, it was only in the underworld that sponsored uh, jazz and, and, you know, when it, you know, in its origin, the underworld. Mm -hmm. And then in Chicago, people like uh, Al Capone, uh, uh, you know, uh, sponsored uh, Louis, he, uh, Al Capone uh, sponsored a hundred musicians I read in, in uh, Dangerous Rhythms. Uh, so the underworlds were, were, were the patrons of jazz long before Lincoln, before the conservatories, places like Lincoln Center, uh, legitimatized the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, form. So when, when we had a, uh, a fundraiser for the SF Jazz Center at uh, the home of uh, Robert Anderson, Mailer Anderson, overlooking uh, uh, the bay, I said, well, you know, one of the patrons of jazz was out there in a prison in Alcatraz, Al Capone. See, so uh, that was that was a big backlash against uh, jazz. Now, when you talk about the blues, uh, not only uh, well, I mean, some say say that that scale, the pentatonic scale, has an origin in Africa. Right? You hear it in a lot of cultures. Um, they talk these. Uh, I, there's a there's this uh, admiration for, or there's some story about Robert Johnson. Uh, meaning the devil or something like that, but but another version is that it was Eshu mm -hmm. met at the crossroads, as crossroads, and so you know throughout North America, uh, you'll find these uh, Yoruba uh, entities referred to. That I mean, the people didn't forget them when they came over here. Mm -hmm. So improvisation uh, is something that people who are oppressed or under occupation. Yeah have to learn and uh that that is that is the key to uh i think that's the key to uh, uh our uh, music absolutely one of, one of the things that emerges from this improvisation let's call it a strategy is a unique ability to allow one's intuitions to draw from any source in order to tell the story Right. So uh, we see this in, in mumbo jumbo, the way that you uh, interpolate and weave together uh, images mm -hmm. uh, throughout in, in the manner of, uh, of a rhythmic accent, mm -hmm. you know, which causes this kind of propulsive forward leaning momentum throughout the book. But uh, this too, to get back to the point you made is part of that unique spirit of improvisation. And again, uh, the willingness of the artist, in this case, we're talking about mumbo jumbo, but I think this could be extended to uh, people uh, like Betty Saar, for instance. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. who, who, who draw uh, improvisationally from uh, a, a, a seemingly uh, infinite uh, palette, mm -hmm. uh, the ability to collage in, or I use the word weave uh, in uh, uh, images, sounds, quotes, from from other uh, texts uh, from the present time and antiquity uh, to create uh, an immediate impression of spiritual vitality and sustenance. And this improvisational spirit, this strategy, again, uh, to emphasize some points that you made earlier, is really, uh, uh, as you said, emergent from the retention of African religions <laughs> through mm -hmm. uh, uh, the transatlantic slave trade, but very much uh, amplified in every corner of the Americas today. Um, so I want to uh, talk a little bit about that because uh, uh, one of uh, 
the most innovative and exciting elements of the way that you compose uh, your novels, and this is true of your, your, your plays and poetry, uh, is precisely this, this, this kind of uh, uh, weaving together, a uh, collage kind of uh, effect, assemblage kind of effect, uh, drawing from your own intuitions towards any object or goal that you wish uh, to conceive and helping us understand uh, this message that you're bringing today. And uh, that, again, getting back to mumbo jumbo, there are uh, very uh, salient and powerful elements of cinema uh, as well as music. Radio, of course, which we talked about a little bit and very much at the center of things, uh, dance, uh, dance by way of uh, leading towards spiritual uh, possession, possession by these, by these entities. So I, I would like, if you can, to speak to us a little bit about this because you mentioned improvisation I describe this as a strategy, but the the cinematic elements of style uh, that you use and the the way in which you uh, interpolate elements that uh, prior uh, to mumbo jumbo would probably have been considered non literary. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they presage a lot of the things that we see today. Could you talk to us about those cinematic elements and other elements that are you know. Uh, innovative in terms of their their non literary character, but you 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 make them a part of your work. Yeah, we grew up on uh, movies and uh, television, and so when I wrote Yellowback Radio, broke down, which became Blazing Saddles, thanks to uh, Richard Pryor. Right. Uh, you know, I was thinking of radio scripts. That's why I call it Yellow Yellowback for uh, the style of uh, novel that dudes from the East wrote about. Uh, wrote about uh, cowboys, part of the occupation, took mm -hmm. over Native American land, like in Oklahoma. That was, that, was, that was a myth that we grew up with, unexamined, right? Uh, and uh, so, I, you know, I used to listen to uh, Westerns on the radio. Uh, broke down means to dismantle, or what I did was to uh, use the formula of the Westerns and broke them down. Uh, and uh, so that was influenced by popular media, and uh, so was uh, Mumbo Jumbo was influenced by uh, popular media, like a detective of movies that I've seen. So, for example, yeah. I call it a, it's like a, it's a, it's a hyper textual, I guess, West, Western, I mean, mystery novel in the sense that, you know, there's one point where uh, they brought, assemble everybody, movies that we they still do that they assemble everybody and point to the point to the source of the crime mm -hmm. and this was meant to be you know like to, uh, comical mm -hmm. so the guy goes all the way back to ancient Egypt by the time he's finished everybody's asleep you know so <laughs> I mean, so yeah there, there was cinematic uh uh, use of popular culture, which which unites uh, Betty Sauer with, I just wrote a piece for the the Huntington Museum exhibit for Betty Sauer, and she uh, also uses popular items because she's very brave because she uh, revived these old uh, images that uh, the, you know the black middle class want you know wanted to do away with you know. You know what? At, what at the new Negro in twenty said, "Well, you know, aunt, the aunt and uncle have passed on. Well, she revived those Aunt Jemima, and mm -hmm. but in a different context, right? I think what happened in the nineteen sixties, you had artists, black artists, who inverted uh, some of these, uh, like a chord inversion, they, right? The new sound, different sound, uh, that were stereotypes, mm -hmm. and they." Uh, and she also uh, has some good words for Booker T. Washington. That was Darren at the time. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine, Sarah Washington, was the uh, the granddaughter of Booker T. Washington. She said her mother wouldn't even mention his name because mm -hmm. he'd been vilified so much by 60s uh, radicals who all ended up being professors. <laughs> the ones who didn't end up being professors are in prison. So. Uh, uh, you know, she she that was very daring of her, but 
but Adrian Kennedy also uses popular culture. You know, mm-hmm. so you might you might find movie stars like Betty Betty Davis, you know, being uh, invoked in her pl- her, her plays or you know popular images. And so, uh, and they didn't stand still. You know, I mean, uh, Betty Sock could have just uh, made a very handsome living recycling stereotypes. Mm-hmm. You know, where the watermelon becomes an object of sacrament. You know, mm-hmm. matter of fact, uh, New York Times recently, Joseph Apaku, I've just gotten back in touch with him of Not Publishers, NLK Publishers, Published Secretary of the Spirits. They had a, they had a, the, the cover of the New York Times recently, but they also had the cover of Love Story Black, which I published, and and the paint the uh, cover is done by Leslie, you know uh, Betty Sars uh, daughter. Yeah. I, I yeah. call her one of the one of the artists in a tradition of Afro Gothicism. Yes, and uh, and so I said, well, New York Times Magazine has acknowledged two black publishers, but they didn't give me credit for the Love Story Black, hmm. right? And also mm-hmm. they give mm-hmm. Allison Mills. Too. We first published Allison Mills, at least Washington Post. Of the Washington Post did that, but anyway, she didn't stand still. And you look at her new work; uh, it's it's taken on a different uh, form. She's got a, uh, you know, the uh, the, the uh, a, uh, a a a piece about the blues where you have just a blue bed. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, just more sophisticated use of variety of materials. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely belong to, to to that idea of using popular culture, but also with what they call High culture, that's in there too, in my work. One of the uh, great advances uh, that you and some of the other artists that you, you mentioned just now achieved was uh, to helping uh, the rest of us understand the way in which uh, popular culture plays out this kind of Jekyll and Hyde Mm-hmm. principle and interest scenario in our uh, in, in, in the very battles and uh, in, in the very wars, spiritual and material uh, that have their origins in antiquity. Mm-hmm. And one of the uh, uh, one of the axes around which mumbo jumbo revolve is, precisely this, and it has to do with the plot points that concern themselves directly with the way in which the press, what today we call uh, media, employ these kind of archetypes, stereotypes, images that resonate within the subconscious or unconscious to force into material political situations and political motives that sometimes the actors themselves are actually completely unaware of. Mm-hmm. In other words, the, the, the archetypes or the images that are motivating them, they're, they're uh, unawares of, of where this is coming from. Now, uh, Mumbo Jumbo has really done the lion's share of the work, I believe, uh, over the last uh, a century or so in helping to decipher and interpret and understand the many ways in which uh, this, this this complex equation that I'm just describing actually plays itself out. Uh, but it is also uh, in some ways the predicate to some of uh, the most trenchant and trenchant and forensic uh, work that you've done in your nonfiction. That is to say, to focus those crosshairs on the way in which media and popular culture uh, are, are, are weaponized uh, to either uh, bring forward uh, what is happening uh, uh, today, which is uh, uh, genocidal uh, in relation to uh, Africans and the Americans and Africans on the European and African continent, uh, but also uh, many of the cultures which have been um, uh, targeted uh, by uh, the, the monotheistic uh, European American uh, West uh, uh, towards its destruction, towards its own self destruction as well. Could you comment a little bit on that, uh, Ishmael? Because again, it is one of the central axes around which the plot of Mumbo Jumbo revolves the use of the press or the media to forward these images 
uh, and and weaponize them. Yeah, well, they make money. They make they make millions, like Tucker Carlson. They make millions of dollars of scapegoating uh, blacks and uh, stirring up fears against blacks, especially black men. Mm -hmm. You can see this happening twenty four hours a day. Uh, I don't see any difference between the way uh, Julius Stryker of uh, Der Sturmer depicted Jewish males and uh, the way black men are depicted in this country. Now, I, that, it never occurred to me until I went to a lecture sponsored by the San Francisco Holocaust Museum where they showed images of the way Jewish uh, men were depicted in Nazi media, like rapists and you know corrupting Aryan women and all the whole thing, criminality. And uh, then they mentioned in the, uh, the pamphlet accompanying the showing of this film called uh, about uh, Jude Swiss, uh, that uh, this, the same stereotypes applied to black men in the United States. I said, what are they talking about? Mm -hmm. I went and examined them too. So I don't see any difference between uh, the way Steven Spielberg, for example, depicts black men in the color purple, which has done more damage than uh, Bull Connor. You know, I've been around the world and uh, wherever I go, they, you know, they talk about that film in the image of the black men in that film. Mm -hmm. And Alice Walker, uh, I don't know, who uh, outsiders have tried to create a feud between the two of us, said it wasn't based on a book. <laughs> mm -hmm. So he took a lot of liberties. And whatever anxieties, uh, you know, uh, that he has about black men, he's able to make money at it. Bill Maher the same way. Bill Maher is considered like an expert on black culture now. Mm -hmm. He, last week he did a thing about you know black people killing each other in Chicago and not reading books. You know, uh, mm -hmm. black so black people read and brown people read books that have something to do with their background. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, I met a I met a uh, one of these uh, people who had been appointed to some post out here in Oakland, or who who had won an election. Mm -hmm. He said he learned how to read and write because he wanted to read Solo Nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I go to prisons, you know, people <laughs> are reading in prison. 61% of the teachers in this country are white women. So I don't think, I think that's part of the problem. But when you get black men going into uh, prisons, like uh, Celeste Tisdale, a friend of mine just got a book out, a book about uh, Attica. I went to Attica, I go to these prisons, a Attica prison. And he uh, <clears throat> prints some of their poetry. So, you know, why is it that uh, black and brown men have, boys have to go to prison, learn how to read and write? That says something about the public school. But he went on and on. And see, this is one of the, I mean, it makes me angry. They get, as a matter of fact, they've hired him on CNN where he talks about, you know, why don't black people do this way? And why don't they talk about black on black crime? Nobody talks about it. You know, an asshole. Mm -hmm. Black people and intellectuals and black politicians have been talking about this fratricide for uh, decades. Yeah, he, just, indeed. he just doesn't read it. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, they don't talk about how bef be, uh, be before uh, uh, Ronald Reagan uh, put crack in our communities, the black on black crime thing is going down. Then it's like a V. It goes down. Then all of a sudden, I, saw, I see I live in the neighborhood here. Mm -hmm. Glenn Lowry, he had Glenn Lowry on, you know. Mm -hmm. And Lowry didn't challenge him and just sort of like agreed with him since that has something to do with morality. No, these guys are fighting over drug turfs. Mm -hmm. And that, that started when, when Reagan and his allies, the Contras, put this, 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 uh, these drugs into our neighborhood. And that's why I say my play, the model minorities make all the money from inner city vice. The blacks get the casualties. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at TV, you think that uh, all the money's made on the distribution end. No, I wrote a, a, a piece for Audible, a short story that's available called uh, uh, The Man Who Haunted Himself. Well, I talk about a white family supplying the uh, ghettos with uh, guns. Mm -hmm. You don't talk about the supply side because most of the guns come from red states. Mm -hmm. Highest crime rates are in red states. So they get on that live, Bill Maher, gets on there and lie, and now he's got a little spot on CNN because CNN has gone to the right. They fired Don Lemon. Now they hired Charles Barkley, who uh, loathes Black people. I mean, all the things I read about him, 
Mm -hmm. You know, black people have been brainwashed. And I mean, so, you know, I think he's probably a, a conservative or something that you might call. They give him a job at CNN. And then last night before they, uh, uh, be, before they showed Bill Maher talking about black people and shit and all this whole kind of stuff, they had uh, uh, their new expert, this cop who's the expert at CNN, justifying uh, the cop who got who killed Brianna Taylor getting a new job. So this guy, uh, this guy Lish L I C H T, who's taking over CNN, but he he's he's uh, trying to get some of the Fox people because they make money at rates. So matter of fact, when Rick Sanchez Remember they fired Rick Sanchez? Mm -hmm. He said the president of CNN says race sells. Race mm -hmm. sells. I mean, Jeff, uh, uh, Jeff Tucker made, they made Donald Trump. They created him. Mm -hmm. If you go to the Shorenstein Center at Harvard, he got much more coverage in the media than Hillary Clinton. And mm -hmm. so they're still making money off of him. You know, mm -hmm. he's way to make some money, even though they say they despise him, but they made him. They created him. And in the New York Times, that Jeff Tucker, Zucker, excuse me, Jeff Zucker uh, created. Uh, so this is what we're up against. Uh, and, you know, blacks could uh, end this like they ended Imus, Don Imus, by boycotting uh, the sponsors. But, but, they're, they're, but uh, you know, we're in this old, you know, 1950s civil rights mode. Uh, and uh, the old, old timers won't get out of the way. I mean, you got a new generation, those two kids down there in Tennessee. These old times with their old strategies won't get out of the way. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to uh, re return to uh, not just simply the, the prescience of the vision in mumbo jumbo as related to these ideas of how uh, the press and the media and popular culture employ specific archetypes and images uh, towards uh, uh, the, the, the detriment of an often uh, bewildered and unknowing uh, populace, not just by extracting uh, massive amounts of, of cash and stuffing it into their coffers, uh, but also uh, uh, transforming and, and directing uh, uh, political events uh, as their audiences are, are often, as I mentioned, and as you've written about, unawares of the uh, psychological effect uh, that, that it is happening on them. Um, and, and, and by way of that discussion, I, I, I want to uh, return to uh, the circumstances surrounding the uh, composition of uh, uh, Mumbo Jumbo, uh, which was in Berkeley, California. Uh, it's, 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 it's signed there at, at the end, uh, January 31st, 1971. And for those of our uh, viewers, our listeners who, who, who may not uh, be up to speed on um, the uh, cultural and political context of that particular moment, especially in the East Bay, especially in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, was that this was a, a, a moment in the history of the United States when the cultural revolution of the 1960s, emerging in the 70s, was teetering on what very well may have been and possibly uh, uh, was, but was curtailed, a political revolution. The United States government was uh, under Nixon, uh, very co close uh, to collapsing. The uh, uh, so-called uh, proletariat was being uh, organized uh, towards uh, a revolutionary agenda uh, by leaders uh, all across the country, but particularly based in the East Bay. And in, 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 in directing our attention to this, in terms of the composition of mumbo jumbo, I wanna mention something about uh, Jean Genet and the Black Panthers, because this very same moment, Genet was brought to the Bay Area and he upbraided and denounced a lot of the white counterculture for their failure to embrace black leadership in the revolutionary struggle specifically. And he also uh, suggested that the countercultural press, the underground press was spending too much time uh, to put it far too simply on sex, drugs and rock and roll. In other words, uh, by putting uh, uh, prurient interest stories uh, about uh, sex and the drug culture 
in between uh, more uh, serious political analysis, uh, they were capitulating uh, to uh, counter-revolutionary uh, imperialist goals. So with that in mind, could, could you talk to us a little bit about the circumstances that were evolving in the San Francisco Bay Area, which again, as I mentioned a few moments ago, were very much a part of the revolutionary global history that was taking place inside of the United States at that time, much of which has been violently suppressed in recent years, by the way, as you know. Yeah, well, I think a lot of uh, some of these uh, bourgeois New Yorkers sort of like uh, try to interfere with the uh, evolution of Black Panthers by imposing Elgis Cleaver on them. On them. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, they're the ones who uh, give him a lot of publicity, like in Ramparts and other places. And finally, he and uh, Huey Newton became involved in a feud, uh, which is how uh, these outsiders, uh, you know, create big friction between, you know, the nationalists and the uh, and the uh, those who believe in coalitions. Uh, uh, but but we've been out there before, you know, in the 1920s, you had Claude McKay, mm -hmm. and Hughes, and they were directed by the Communist Party to go after the Black Nationalists at Harlem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's history. Of this. I wrote, wrote about this in a play called The Final Version, about a, 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 uh, a famous author who's trying to denounce his, uh, or deny his radical past. Uh, so there's been this friction all the way from the time that... Uh, that uh, you know, the uh, Communist Party of the United States uh, transferred their interest in uh, police brutality, black issues, homegrown issues, for uh, in order to save the sector, or, or abandon those issues in order to save the, the Soviet Union. So uh, that, that that's been a tension since then. And so uh, I was in Leonard Bernstein's apartment before they had, before the uh, New York liberals had that reception for the Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wanted me to write uh, the libretto for, uh, we had the same attorneys. He wanted me to write the libretto for the mass, that mass that he, mm -hmm. and uh, he said, well, you know, your name won't be ranked along mine and Jerome Robbins, the choreographer, because uh, <laughs> nobody knows the book, who wrote the book for Figaro or one of Mozart's pieces. And I said, well, you know, if I collaborate with the two of you, my name's gotta be up there with yours. And then I told him that Victor Cruz could have written a better book for West Side Story. He, <laughs> he entered the interview, you know. And, that was it. But I saw uh, Solo and Ice on the, on the table. I guess he was trying to impress me. And mm -hmm. so the following week, uh, you know, they had that reception for, uh, for uh, the Black Panthers because they had gotten sick of Bal Baldwin. You know, Baldwin had bitten the hand that fed him and made him. He was an attack dog, you know, Chester Hines, Chip Langston Hughes, a uh, number of writers. He had to, you know, feel he had to walk over in order to get to the top of the heap. Uh, but then he insulted, he insulted them for, uh, with that, uh, tell me how long the train's been gone, where he took on uh, Lee, Lee uh, uh, Strasberg and Actor Studio and members of the family, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the cultural art, artistic elite. And so uh, they got, Mario Puzo, the guy who wrote The Godfather, as if they're in the same category, Mario Puzo and James Baldwin. And Mario Puzo did the hatchet job at the New York Times Book Review, which is a family, the family's journal. So uh, so they, they got uh, Elders Cleaver. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think the, the Black Panthers, they imposed upon the Black Panthers an agenda that they couldn't possibly uh, meet uh, because they were a community organization around the corner. I live in the neighborhood where they all grew up, and around the corner you'll see their uh, first uh, their first uh, success was to put a traffic light around the corner here, so that uh, kids wouldn't be injured on the way to school. So they were a community group, and then you got these New Yorkers uh, who you know imposed upon them uh, other issues, and, mm -hmm. and and in terms of uh, white leadership, uh, Rudd R U D D. The weatherman, uh, he he admitted that uh, you know the newspapers featured him because he resembled them. You know, mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean the Lower East Side was all about black civil rights and black culture, but when Life Magazine 
uh, did a, a study, a, a issue about the Lower East Side that was going on in the 1960s, all this cultural interaction, uh, they put Ed Sanders, my friend, on the cover. Mm -hmm. They're always going to, you know, choose the whites to lead it, you mm -hmm. know, like, uh, uh, just like uh, Elvis Presley's the king of rock and roll, and uh, Eminem is the king of hip hop, and so, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the uh, aspects of mumbo jumbo that is unique is the dimensions of its fertility in terms of igniting the imagination in its readers has extended into all of the arts, which is a highly unusual circumstance for a work of literature to have uh, such a expansive presence in arts, uh, you know, far, far, far beyond uh, the literary. Many of the, uh, people who have praised or uh, brought the work very, very close into their own include uh, hip hop artists like uh, Tupac Shakur famously directing his listeners to your work as a key to uh, deciphering uh, the African origins of Western civilization, uh, but also famously one of the major uh, popular composers coming from the United States, uh, George Clinton, who uh, put mumbo jumbo at the center as the origin of the mythologies uh, that emerge within the, the body of work that comes from uh, Parliament and Funkadelic. Uh, but those are those are just two uh, examples from the world of music. The 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 fertile and imaginative and illuminating uh, horizons that have been set off in the imagination of many artists include uh, people in film, in dance and choreography, obviously uh, theater, uh, but also painting and photography, all of which you as an artist uh, have developed into all of those areas. Uh, but could you speak a little bit about this uh, uh, power uh, as it extends into uh, the other arts and, and why that has been such an important component in, in, in your own work to be able to uh, have this uh, uh, very, very welcoming <laughs> and uh, generous uh, view about literature as including all of these other elements and not so exclusive onto itself. Oh yeah, well, um, that was the first time that it happened. Like, uh... Boots O'Reilly, who who said said that sorrow to bother you, mm -hmm. he said it was influenced by the Paul Bears, freelance Paul Bears. Mm -hmm. and then I wrote a virtual curse on Richard Nixon called the Hexorcism of Noxon the Awful. Yeah, it made me change the name to Noxon, but I, the original title was Nixon. But people at Random House that was an Amistad that was edited by uh, by uh, Charles Harris and Johnny Williams that. Sec, I think it was the second issue of Amistad, the, Her the Hexorcism Knocks in the Awful, which has been published separately. Yes. And uh, and uh, uh, Mojo Nixon, this white uh, 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 rock and roll star. Mm -hmm. Mojo Nixon, that idea came from that, that story. And then of course, Mumble Jumbo influenced, Mumble Jumbo influenced uh, probably the ancestor of Ragtime. Right. Uh, United, we had a confrontation about it, and uh, because uh, when I read an excerpt of his uh, novel, he, he was in the audience when I read from Mumble Jumbo at Sarah Lawrence. So when I read an excerpt of uh, Ragtime, I, I sent him a postcard saying, just an excerpt. I said, glad you like my book. <laughs> and uh, then we, we were at the American Civil Liberties. We got awards at the American Civil Liberties, some session there. I remember Baldwin being surrounded by photographers. And uh, then we ran into each other and we went into a restaurant. He said, he, he said he thought the postcard I sent to him was bullshit. Mm -hmm. So I all these people all over the country and in Europe who said that he got the book from me. And he said, well, I, I can understand how you feel. And then, um, uh, you know, of course, Blazing Saddles and Yellowback Radio broke down. I told uh, Colin that when I die, uh, 
I want to be buried next to the Secretariat or Man of War, one of these Kentucky Derby horses, because I've earned more money for white men than these horses. <laughs> I mean, that's that, but that comes along with the territory. You can see how, you know, you have to admire Chuck Berry and Little Richard, and you know, people have made billions, and Ike Turner made billions off of their stuff, you know, so that's not a surprise. But there was a Jess Drew Orchestra. Mm -hmm. There's a group of uh, white, white guys called Jess Grew. There was the Wallflower Order of the Dance Brigade. Uh, they, so it, it branched out and influenced uh, Godard. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make a film of Mumble Jumbo. Uh, the, this guy who's, who stars in X, The X-Files, got a, what's his name, David? I've forgotten his name, last name. The X-Files. He wanted to write a paper on Mumble Jumbo when he was at Yale. And on and on and on. So, mm -hmm. but I, you know the work uh, that I I believe uh, that's been neglected, but that's that's coming to an end. My terrible series, which I see as a as a uh, improv in jazz uh, improvisation on the, the American Zeitgeist from Reagan to now and continuing, continuing. Mm -hmm. I'm working on the terrible fives. That has gotten a weird reception. Uh, and and uh, I sort of said, you know, when I read "Cool the Cool Million by Nathaniel West, I said, this is this is the kind of novel that I want to extend. Mm -hmm. he, he went to Hollywood and was killed, you know. And although he ran a hotel in New York for writers, he's probably superior to he's probably a superior writer to some of the people. Uh, he also he, that was the early influence because I never influenced him even because I never seen a writer use a collage. I seen I seen uh, I worked in the library, so I saw a lot of painters use it. But he, you know, Dream Life of Balsam Snow, he uses a collage. That impressed me when I was going to school. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I said I want to write an extended uh, piece about uh, just improv improvisation on the absurdity and and the uh, sort of like uh, the uh, incredibly surrealist zeitgeist that's going on in, in, in American culture all the way up to, uh, to, uh, to uh, and you know, the, uh, the, uh, the terrible twos uh, prophesizes Paul the Soviet Union. Right. Lee Gates didn't have a clue, but not only did it prophesy the uh, Paul the Soviet Union, but uh, identify the place where the revolt would start circumstances under which the revolt would start in Latvia, that people would be singing folk songs, which is what happened. And uh, that happened a few years later. Same, that event happened a few years later. And the, it also, uh, it, it also uh, predicts the rise of Trump. I have a character named Termite Control, you know, who's into uh, necrophilia, right? And uh, candidate. Uh, so that that was important from, but it, it, some say the pallbearers is making a comeback because of Harry Sam is a Trump-like figure. <laughs> I'm just playing with the zeitgeist. So what happened was uh, that uh, Stanley Crouch's only disciple did one of the weirdest hatchet jobs on the Terrible Threes. You know, I think you know who I'm talking about. Oh, Gerald Early. Yeah, uh, and uh, there was no indication in the review that he had read the novel. He didn't mention a single character, he didn't mention the storyline, and just saw like an ad hominem attack on me. And Rebecca Penny Sinkler, the feminist who was editing the New York Times book review at the time, put him up to it. I, uh, I uh, was having lunch with, I had a, a lunch engagement with Brent Staples who works for the Times, and she crashed the luncheon and spent all the luncheon praising Tony Morrison, who's a friend of mine. They tried to do it. That, what's this guy's name? That token guy? Uh, yes. Yeah. He said, you know, that T Tony Morrison, I, Tony Morrison and I were friends until her death. I mean, I had conversations right. with her when she's on her deathbed. Uh, and uh, matter of fact, she uh, saved us thousands of dollars by lending her, her us uh, her apartment. We were going to, Undergoing rehearsal for the haunting Lynn Manuel Miranda. So I, that's why I call her my patron. I don't know which, I don't know how she felt about, about 
what I call a Confederate statue on stage, the Hamilton thing. But uh, uh, but she, she, I mean, she was, you know, I mean, Toni Morrison was an excellent novelist, great, terrific, and and but you know, Gail, people on her list, Gail Jones and Tony K. Bombard, they went right just as well, you know. But but Tony was at the center of a uh, center of the New York publishing world. I'm not saying that that's the reason you know she gets a reputation over them, but she's a good, excellent writer. Uh, but they tried to, you know. But anyway, she spent all that time, and what you have now are uh, are uh, you know white women with money because the, the, the women I know who went to New York, I, I sent two of them, my students to New York uh, to uh, work as editors, to become editors. They couldn't afford to live there. So now you got these women with, uh, can afford to live in New York, imitating trends of black literature. So, I mean, that was her hatchet job. Now, when she jumped on mail, she got fired. <clears throat> She tried to say stuff on Norman Bale and she got they fired her. You know, uh, this remarkable prescience, which has unfolded uh, throughout your work over the decades has, has been uh, notable and, and the source of uh, admiration, but also envy not just among your admirers, but al also those who, who would designate themselves as, as enemies, which is a rare occurrence uh, among artists, that is to say, uh, to uh, have this kind of respect uh, across the entire panorama. Uh, that, that is to say, those who, who would rather that you cease <laughs> and, and, and those who would uh, celebrate uh, and extend the uh, traditions that you bring into into being. Now, part of that uh, concerns itself, getting back to mumbo jumbo, uh, with the simple, extraordinary, ordinary fact, which is that this is one of the most studied uh, works uh, in literature uh, of, 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 of recent uh, uh, vintage, you know, say the last hundred years or so. I mean, the amount of analysis uh, and, and critique uh, that has weighed in on this one particular novel is is just voluminous. So, uh, with that in mind, you know, I mean, any any work of art uh, is an expression of uh, the unexpressed but intended, the unintentionally expressed. And when you look at all of this uh, material, uh, attempting to uh, explicate or decipher the meaning of this work and, and other works by you. Um, are there points that you, that you feel in particular are either denied or missing? Some, some element where you just kind of shake your, your head and say, how could they have missed that? How could they have misunderstood that? Or is it something uh, perhaps uh, more sinister with like these deliberate misreadings of the terrible series. I mean, what what do you see going on there as 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 the author of this work, which has again been so uh, voluminously interpreted and critiqued, uh, and and doubtlessly uh, will be for centuries to come? Is there some element that you think, man, these people really aren't getting it? No, I think that what's happened is that the uh, the uh, I used to call it Eurocentric, but the uh, the Anglo uh, perspective about American literature is uh, obsolete mm. uh, and incapable of assessing multicultural literature. So uh, I used to call it Eurocentric, but I've been to Europe where uh, Black studies are taught at some of the universities that were founded before the arrival of Europeans in the, with, the, with the Native Americans called the invasion of North America. Mm -hmm. We teach Black literature at Heidelberg founded in the 1300s of 12, and uh, they teach uh, black literature at the University of Rome, which is 12, these are old, some of the oldest universities in Europe. Mm -hmm. I don't call it Eurocentric. I think it's, uh, I think it's a, a, an education uh, curriculum that, that's causing hate crimes all over the country. Absolutely. Because it teaches white kids that they're gods. 
the, the, I mean, if you read the literature, you know, like they're, they're like divine or something. The rest of us are subhuman or monkeys. Uh, is that it, it? It doesn't cover Europe all that well, mm. you know. And uh, you know, and but they insist that they're gods. This whole thing about Cleopatra, a black woman playing Cleopatra. I mean, it's like you know, it's kind of kind of right. it's kind of crazy outbreak that I got with when I challenged Hamilton who was a slave owner and uh, treated slaves very badly and sold black, uh, at least black, one black woman and a child for $200 or so. But I mean, there was no secret about his being a slave master, but Lynn manuel Miranda, I think was interested in putting together a whole lot of show tunes. And what he did was he took uh, his lead from this uh, Ron Cherno, who's one of these historians who tries, you know, gets prizes and course adoptions by, you know, idolizing the uh, so-called founders who were terrible people. You know, I mean, they talk about how Hamilton tr uh, treated uh, blacks, but what about his uh, proposal that Native Americans be exterminated? They, they never get to that part. Red lives don't matter. So uh, I think what's happening with, uh, like, you know, I studied Jack when they, when I was left for red roadkill by this uh, these academic feminists, white feminists who hadn't read the book. They had a boycott down there. Of my work of me when I appeared at Baton Rouge University of uh, Louisiana Baton Rouge and the boycott collapsed because they hadn't read my books. Uh, I said, I, you know, I I don't feel I have to be restricted by the kind of uh, barriers placed on uh, uh, black writers. This guy Paul Devlin sums it up. I thank him for that because he said I'd have gone too far mm -hmm. with, the, with juice. Mm -hmm. I'd gone too far. So I studied Japanese, man. I got a great reception for Japanese by spring in Japan. He liked it. These people here didn't have a clue. And then um, uh, the, the, you know, uh, the Chinese uh, declared it a uh, a national project, which, which they, which meant they provided funds for its research in China. So I went, got two trips to China, to studying Japanese all those mornings where I go up to my tutor and struggle through the language. Uh, and then I studied Hindi. So I think that. You know, my in Yoruba, I went to Yoruba and read my poems in Yor in, in Yoruba and Lagos and uh, probably, you know, it's but not bad, it's okay. So I think the 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 point of me, especially with black men, is that uh they become global writers and get a global perspective, which we were trying to do in before Columbus. Mm -hmm. You know, before Columbus was has been imitated in Europe and other places, um, in order to not to be restricted. And not to be told like people like Paul Devlin that you've gone too far, which is the only what slave master you say to fugitive slaves, remember? That you've gone too far. Slave patrol, literary slave patrollers, pet patrollers. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the crisis in American academia and in and uh, an American intellectual elite, which is you know ninety percent white, is that they're out. They just can't. First of all, they lie about the American past and they don't have a clue about the American future. Mm -hmm. A part of uh, what you're expressing here, which I think is so important uh, to our listeners and your readers, our audience today and in the future to understand is this expression of the black writer or the Black artist in America as being a uh, emissary of Black internationalism, which is something that was advocated as a uh, political and social and economic uh, position by uh, both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King in their in their later years that the uh, Black in America could uh, elevate the domestic struggle to an international human rights struggle and thus achieve uh, the goals of emancipation and, and, and freedom. Uh, but this was also uh, a position that was taken up uh, by Ted Jones. Uh, Ted Jones, going back into the early 1960s um, with poems like Afrique Accidental, which was published in City Lights Journal number one, by the way. Um, and this, uh, what you're providing with us uh, here this afternoon um, is something that I think is key, not just to our uh, survival, 
uh, but to replenish the soil <laughs> that, that, that has really become a kind of fallow field here uh, in, in American uh, uh, literature and, and art. Could you, could you speak to that a, 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 a bit more? Because I think this uh, vision which you're articulating of the Black artist status globally is something that is um, least understood uh, uh, these days. Although it was very celebrated for you know, a, a, a particular moment uh, that we spoke of earlier during the, the uh, cultural and potential political revolution, uh, it's, it's been somewhat uh, diminished in, in, in recent years. Could you, could you amplify or extend a bit more on the importance of accepting or embracing that uh, internationalism? Yeah, well, they, they uh, probably don't, uh, I think uh, <clears throat> black artists don't know the, uh, the effect they're having globally. I think the hip hoppers know, Africa Bambada and people like that, because hip hop is like the, uh, the standard language of, uh, of uh, youth all over the world. Mm -hmm. From the North Pole to, uh, you know, Patagonia or whatever, uh, or in, all over Europe. Matter of fact, I'm in contact with a hip hop artist in Italy. She says, Susan LaPola says that that's the standard music, mm -hmm. mainstream music in Italy. Mm -hmm. It's the here because they're always a play to play to a black insurgency. You know, that's what the guns are for. You know, they're, mm -hmm. always, they're always afraid that, uh, you know, blacks are going to take over or whatever, culturally and politically, or whatever. So, uh, you know, hip hop has a lot of influence. Uh, and uh, the black aesthetic is probably admired. As a matter of fact, these uh, you know Africans, some of whom despise blacks, they pass for black Americans in uh, Europe and Japan and Paris. And right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it must there must be something about it. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that uh, you know that, that uh, of course hip hop has a lethal side. I wrote about I'm writing about Ari Melber sort of like a black explainer at uh, MSNBC. Mm -hmm. He's called uh, how many how many rappers have to die so that Ari Melville might look dope. <laughs> and you know he gets more you know this is one of the curses that we have in this country. Bill Maher, Brett Stevens, and uh, Ari Melville have more time to talk about black culture than any hundred black intellectuals or scholars. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. things up but anyway it does have a I, I, look, I wrote a piece about uh, Davy D and uh, you know who wrote uh, you know this hip hop book and uh, I, I was doing research and I was just shocked by the uh, the number of hip hoppers who've been murdered since mm -hmm. 10 so a, there's a long casualty list and uh, you know and, and he I remember Praises uh, Lil Wayne, for example, and then people murdered at you know Lil Wayne concerts, and uh, he came out here in Oakland. Two pe two people were murdered at the after party, so it's like a like a, a carnival of death. And some of the music is like uh, could have been written by gun manufacturers. Mm -hmm. so that's another side to it, a toxic side to it, which uh, these people when they talk about. These these black on black shootings don't take in, take into uh, take into account. So there's but but a lot, you know but I mean you mentioned Tupac Shakur and others They're geniuses. I mean it's like any art other art any art form it it, it ranges from the poor and uh, to the excellent. Mm -hmm. But R. Melber doesn't un can't tell the difference between something really trite and Badu, you know who's a guest of his, who's an excellent artist, a pure artist, who he gets it all, it's all the same to him. Mm -hmm. They get it all wrong when they talk about hip hop originated 50 years ago. If you look at the uh, West African Yoruba text, uh, Igbo Olodumare of the Forest of God, which uh, my teacher uh, guided me through, uh, you see all the, all the stuff in hip, the style of hip hop, the swagger. Yeah. The fly, uh, Dropping proverbs, mm -hmm. and even singing, even you know, all that's in that text. So I mean, it's probably a West a originated West Africa. And then, then they forget about the toasts, uh, you know, around the 1900s. That's right. 
what the hip hoppers did, but they just added audio equipment. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, but I mean, you know, it's it's a it's a situation where we get explained. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the New York Times book review, which is ignore my five, last five books, they have whites in there talking about black culture all the time, every week, all the time. And some of them are excellent. I don't, want, I don't want to dismiss all white writers, but some of them are excellent. I think maybe forty percent of my library, maybe thirty percent, are by white authors, and I learned a lot from them. But they've done their homework. Mm -hmm. Not like David Simon, who does the same old stereotypes of. Uh, Blacks that the, they did the Jews in uh, Nazi Germany, like pimps and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's about the pimps. They don't make any money at it. No black pimp has made as much money as Jason Epstein. Mm -hmm. not, not Jason, excuse me. What was the name again? <laughs> Jason Epstein. You know, the guy that invited all those people to his townhouse. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and, then, and, then, and then allegedly committed suicide. Right, right. I don't mean him, but, you know, he had nine hundred. Jeffrey. Jeffrey. He had nine hundred. Jason is with Random House. I think he's a former editor there. But Jeffrey, uh, who had nine hundred ninety nine of the most powerful uh, white men in the world as his guests, and their names have not been revealed. Mm -hmm. So Amy, even Amy Goodman, she can jump on uh, Kobe. And you know, lie about the circumstances of his case on a day of his death, mm -hmm. so-called rape thing where a woman lied. But she even even somebody as progressive as she can't, she can't investigate the names on that list. Mm -hmm. It's powerful men in, uh, in the international uh, players. Yeah, there 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 has been a, a, a reluctance uh, on the part of any um, credible. A journalist to investigate uh, the labyrinth of prostitution internationally among the corporate elite oh, throughout the world, and 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 their indulgences into uh, ritual sexual practices. Well, you know, they, connect them to their religious these, origins. These little girls. These little girls. Yeah. Pedophilia. And, I wanted to. Uh, and oh. one of the, who was this guy? Uh, this big, this big uh, high tech guy. Uh, he he's up there. Elon Musk was up there. Uh, Peter Thiel. No, 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 no. This guy. No, this is another guy. He, he's very famous. What guy? Steve. Not. I can't think of his name right now. But his wife said she divorced him because he was up there all the time. Oh yeah, Bill Gates. No. So I I, uh, I wanted to bring up another point regarding mumbo jumbo um, in its historical How much dimension. Time are we going? We got we almost an hour and a half here. How much more time? Uh, well, we can make this the last question. Okay. Um, it happens very often in work of this stature that. The work of art itself takes on the dimensions of its own separate life. Mm -hmm. Acting in the world mm -hmm. as a human being or entity might, asserting its own identity, making interventions and interrogations, celebrations, pains, joys, satisfactions, refusals. You're, you're, you're describing it as a loa. As a loa, yeah, exactly. Now, I, I can think of, a couple other examples of this. I mean, if we go back into the 1920s, obviously uh, Fitzgerald's Gatsby mm -hmm. is an example of that. Mm -hmm. uh, Mumbo Jumbo is an example of that. Um, for color girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough is an example of that. Yeah, well, they they, uh, they corrupted her script. They certainly did. We were um, the first, the Yardbird was the first to publish an excerpt. Yeah. But it, she, it was it was quite different when they got a hold of these producers. It was quite different on the stage, I think. Yeah, I, I it's it, it's a it's a it's a tragic occasion yeah. the way she's been exploited. Yes, but um, uh, honing in on this, uh, are, are there ways? I, I think of I think of Robert Johnson and and his description of the blues about how he gets up in the morning 
and the blues is right there with him, walking like a man. That's, that's, now, a, that, that, there, that's an African thing where the entities are around you at all times. Yeah. So the African, you know, my teacher said that uh, it was easy to convert. No, it. Uh, one of the ways that that uh, Africans were converted to Christianity because uh, of phonetically Eshu and Jesus. Mm -hmm. And they both are figures at the crossroads. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so I, I, I've always considered that, that fact. Robert Johnson, and uh, you know, you're talking about the blues. Yeah, the blues is a living entity. That's right. To be addressed. And it's like a lower. Yeah. And and I I guess uh, my 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 follow up as a final question would be, are there are there aspects of mumbo jumbo uh, where you know you find this uh, loa this entity uh, talking back to you, and uh, you know uh, yeah it's telling me you'll never surpass me <laughs> because um, see the problem with this early success was that uh, everything you write after that uh, is overshadowed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like reckless eyeballing, had a lot of fun with that one. Japanese mm -hmm. Springs, you know, the terrible series, Juice. Juice. Which is very dis much despised. Mm -hmm. Plus all the theater, I've written about 12 plays. Mm -hmm. So uh, it all goes back to Mumble Jumble. So if, if Mumble Jumble is talking to me, it's saying, yeah, you know, chop this. Although, you know, some was written here. Like I started in New York when I read a book called The Putman, the Putman Medieval Reader, where, I talk, where it was about these dance epidemics. Mm. Plus, Carl was a dancer, a choreographer. I'm sure that. Right. Right. Well, uh, I want to thank you for being so generous with your time. Well, sure, no problem. Thank you, Peter. And, uh, of course, uh, once again, it's a, it's a pleasure to collaborate with you, uh, Peter, and City Lights Books. I think I think it's 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 really uh, appropriate that City Lights sponsors. You know, I admire Lawrence Perlman Getty's work very much. He seemed to be more the most rational among the beats and the most prolific, where some of them, some of them, you know, dug the party part, you know, like, uh, that's one of the reasons Ted Jones left here, you know, he, it was a, like, like a lot of hedon, hedonism, not that I'm a Puritan or anything, but, uh, you know, uh, Lawrence Perlin Getty had a bookstore and he's a publisher and he wrote very well, extremely good writer. And the last uh, message I got from him was uh, after I'd uh, appeared at that uh, tribute to him in San Francisco. And I read from uh, a piece that at the time startled me, you know, uh, the, the, the dinner to impeach President Eisenhower. <laughs> I, was thinking, I was a kid, I said, why does anybody wanna, you know, impeach, he's a war hero and, you know, and just a, you know, great guy. And we all, you know, he's our uncle and, I remember I went to a rally and President, his uh, limousine passed by, paused there, and he was he was asleep, you know, just <laughs> his wife was, you know, maybe sitting there with that weird hat, you know, the one with the little stars and shit on it, you know. I said, why was anybody? And then I've learned, man, that Eisenhower was really insisted that Lumumba be assassinated, man. That's right. That Lumumba be assassinated threaten the Chinese, not only with atomic warfare, but name the ports where the bombs would be dropped. And then when they overthrew some of these governments in South America, Eisenhower was also behind the military planning. So I said, well, I gotta, you know, I said, this is a minor classic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, very nice, nice note. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been such a fantastic and compelling discussion, and it has been such a great honor to have both of you with us today. We, we are happy that Mumbo Jumbo is able to reach yet another generation of readers, and, and thanks to the folks at Scribner Books for bringing this anniversary edition to a larger audience. 
Also want to remind our viewers that we've posted links in the text of the event description with which you may purchase copies of Mujumbo, as well as a full selection of other titles by Mr. Reed. Better yet, if you're in the hood, come on down and browse our stacks. We are in San Francisco's historic North Beach District. We're open seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. This event has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, through our public events, a publishing program, and educational outreach, all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. So thank you for tuning in, everyone. Please take care. We hope to see you soon. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.